Latch the windows, lock the doors, and put the kids to bed. It's time for another episode of Tales from the Garage. I just thought I would start out by showing you this little creature head that I've had for years, actually. Um, I, I bought it, and I actually had it, this little Frankenstein head, hanging up at my old office job. And when I left, it was hanging on my desk. And when I left, I brought it with me. And although you never see it, it's actually sitting here on my computer, um, right underneath the monitor, staring at me every time I'm in here recording a video or doing anything on the computer. And considering it's a Frankenstein head, uh, I figured it was apropos of the season, and I thought I would show it to y'all. Um, also, Halloween is my favorite season, and a dear friend of mine sent me some wonderful haunted Halloween incense. It's just the best. I mean, I like, uh, love Halloween. Actually, it's the only holiday I like, period. And I like it in a big way. Like, you know how some people are just crazy about Christmas? That's me and Halloween. Nothing else compares to it. And um, anything to do with the season is, is welcome and puts me in a good mood. And um, that incense, which I occasionally see at my grocery store where I go shopping, and, you know, even though I have, like, no income, I'll always pick up a box or two every time I see it because they don't have it every year. But this one was sent to me by a dear friend, and it's... Uh, Getting me, it's, it's perfect because just within the last couple of weeks, I started burning incense in here. And actually in the main part of my home as well. Um, not just when I'm out here. And it really sets a nice kind of calm mood, I find. I've loved incense for years, but the, it's only in the last few weeks that I really started burning them again on a regular basis. And now I've even got some holiday incense, which is just, just great. Um... So I'm back again. I'm totally unprepared to do this video, but um, I just thought I'd come out here and do it. This is very rare for me to do to do one at this hour of the day. It's late afternoon. Uh, at least it's not morning. Um, but to, but for me, tales from the garage, more of a nighttime thing, or at least I'm more laid back and relaxed. But thanks to the incense burning. Um, the incense that I have. I haven't lit the Halloween one yet, though. Um, has considerably mellowed me out anyway. So I got some nice feedback about <clears throat> a couple people actually saying that they look forward to my tales from the garage. That's pretty incredible, I find. It's just about the best compliment I could get. And... Um, Maybe goes to show you the sorry state of affairs of what's on TV. I don't know. Though um, I still do have a bunch of cable channels. A couple years ago, I did cancel all my uh, premium movie channels. And every once in a while, I get a free preview of some of these movie channels. You know, these, these uh, Showtimes and HBOs and all that kind of thing. And I watch a whole bunch of stuff on there, but realize I'm not missing much. Um... They don't import and show anything that's really too interesting. It's all Hollywood crap, and all recent Hollywood crap. Um, and even the stuff I like, in terms of genres like horror movies and all that, it's not very good, and it's certainly not worth paying for. Um, and they don't go back and show any old things or European things or the stuff that I like. So, um, increasingly, I guess not surprising, I find myself looking at YouTube a lot and just... You know, and, and getting older, too, because I, I find that the most, the, simply the most exciting thing that I could think of to watch out of anything, any choices, not narrowing it down at all, I would, I would much rather see a couple things. My, because I'm so into music, I would much rather see my favorite musicians, which you're never going to see on American television, whether they're American or not, uh, either being interviewed and talking about their music just in a, you know, I don't need fancy visuals, just two guys sitting in a chair is good for me. Um, or, even better yet, 
maybe a guy in his, you know, musician in his own home, uh, talking about his creative process, or maybe showing you working on some music or something like that. Um, to me, that that beats any any movie with special effects or anything fictional, anything at all. Um, and there's a, there's a few things uh, I found. It was, it was only a few minutes long. Um, and I, I don't know how old it is. I want to say it was done in the last couple of years. I accidentally stumbled across uh, a little what is it, documentary interview slash thing with a Richu Richuiki Sakamoto. Um, and that was really interesting. It was on up on YouTube. I don't think it's more than 10 or 15 minutes or 20 minutes. I don't recall now. I haven't seen it. It's about a year ago that I saw it. Um, but, uh, you know, the Japanese composer, whatever you want to call him, experimental musician. Um, but I was totally unaware that he lives in New York City. I thought he still lived in Japan. So I learned something new about him that I didn't know prior to seeing this um this documentary on him and um, I don't even know if it's part of an official film or what it's it was like an extended news story or something um, but the great thing about it was you actually saw him at home um, working and the layout of his studio which is very interesting because he lives he lives in New York so um, I don't know if it's a condo an apartment or what it is but it's obviously not structured like a house, so he has these kind of narrow rooms that he works in. Um, and it's very interesting to see his layout. Um, and then, you know, you envision his music from there. And um, it was just really interesting. I can't think of anything better than that to see, to watch. Um, and a lot of stuff never, it doesn't matter how many pay TV channels you have, you're probably not going to see that. You're definitely not going to see that. Okay, so I have been chattering on here. Going to go back and do uh, my famous vinyl pulls and see what I come out with. Okay, here's one that I thought I talked about. This is strange. I know I'm not putting these records back into the slot. I'm putting them up in the space above. Um, but L Lorindo Almeida the late great uh, nylon string guitarist who played in a jazz context. This was uh, an album I bought. Uh, this is when Conquer Jazz used to have jazz. I don't know what the hell Conquer Jazz is doing now. I don't think they don't, they don't even call it Conquer Jazz anymore. They've gone the kind of R&B route. And um, it's fine, you know, if selling these R&B record things are going to keep them uh, solvent. But... Um, they pretty much have let most of their jag jazz catalog go out of print, so the label is almost completely useless now, um, sadly. And I just, you know, every once in a while I check back on their website to see, but I don't see any reissues of the classic jazz stuff coming from there. Um, I think this was my first album that I picked up by him. You know, I did pick up... Um, a few videos ago, I selected another album. Is that strange? Because there's only two of them back in, in the in there in the in the in the pile there. Um, I, I picked out a, a, another one of his that I wish I had on CD. But this one, this one I think I do have on CD, and it's a damn good thing because it's out of print. I bought this as a new release. This is recorded in September '79, so I must have bought it in 1980 when it came out. Um, and this is de this is definitely one. Uh, the title of it is called Chamber Jazz, and I would look this up on YouTube if you think you're interested in him at all, because it's um, a particularly good album of his. It is a small group. It's only a trio with Bob Magnuson on upright bass and Jeff Hamilton on drums. Now, Jeff Hamilton was one of the drummers that played in the uh, LA Four which was the Los Angeles-based um, jazz group that Lorindo Almeida was the guitarist in, along with um, was it Bud Shank on saxophones and flutes. And uh, I'm doing this from memory. Ray Brown on bass, I'm pretty sure it was. 
I should know because I've got almost all their recordings. Um, but and that was a hell of a band. I mean, they're very mellow and laid back and conservative jazz. Uh, maybe a bit like um, the modern jazz quartet, the LA Four were. But I just I just love the sound of the LA Four. I love their musical selection, and um, I think this is his first solo up that I ever picked up by Lorindo. Like I said, it's just guitar, bass, and drums. There's no, um, you know, additional horn or string arrangements or anything like that. Does he do any originals here? Well, he does uh, a Debussy piece, a Chopin piece, done all in a, in a jazz jazz way, a Bach piece. So it doesn't look like there's any uh, any originals. But a lot of the tracks are kind of these jazzy arrangements of classical music and it's a beautiful warm it's well recorded album uh, all acoustic you know with the nylon string guitar and upright bass and just acoustic drums it's a very warm sounding thing and of course you know just like always when I pull this out it makes me want to hear them again hear the albums again this I was smart I unlike the the previous uh, I can't remember the title of the previous Lorindo Amida album that I pulled out in an episode going back a ways, but I know I didn't have that one on CD and I can't get it on CD now. Thankfully, this one I picked up on CD, and when I looked this up a little while ago, it was long out of print, really sadly. Um, but it's called Chamber Jazz. I'm pretty sure, pretty sure that there's tracks, if not the whole album, is up on YouTube. And I really suggest it if it sounds like it's your kind of thing at all. And there's nothing difficult about this. None of, you know, there's what, only, uh, only two pieces even go over the five minute point. Um, it's just really, just really warm. He's such a, he's such a professional, profound guitarist, I, I thought. Um, and again, you know, one, one of those guys that I got into, um, obviously, well, I got obviously when he was still alive. And it's quite saddened to hear when he passed away, and it made listening to his music a little bit harder for for ages. And I have that thing: musicians that that um, I get into while they're still around, when they pass away, I generally have this this period. I don't know what you call it a a, a period of mourning, when I find it really hard to listen to their music. Sometimes for years. Um, and there's other people, uh, I'll give you a perfect example, that I'm so in shock when they pass because I was such a big fan of, like, John Abercrombie. And strangely enough, that didn't happen, and I really expected it would with John Abercrombie. And I think, and I can't figure out why, because I was such a big fan of John Abercrombie since about 1978, and he only passed away uh, 13 months ago. Um in August of 2017. Um, but I continued to listen to his music after his passing. And the only reason that I could think of that I was able to do that is because it was such a shock to me, his passing, because he's just one of those top guys to me that um, I think, in a way... I don't believe it. I, I, you know, I, I think it was just such. I don't know what else to say. Such, a, such a, a shock to me that I, I, I just can't really comprehend that he's passed away, in a way, or I just can't accept it, or whatever it is. And I've been listening to his music since his passing, just like I did before he passed away, which to me is very unusual especially with somebody that I'm that fond of and that into for literally decades while he was still alive. So um, who knows why that is, you know? The mind is a funny thing. Am I in danger of not selecting any ECM recordings here? Here's one I didn't know was back there. And... Um, Boy, I've had, I've had this in a, in a few different... Milestones by Miles Davis. What can you say? I was in a Miles Davis period, heavily. 
just before the advent of CDs, and I have so much vinyl by him. And the strange thing is I thought I had all my Miles Davis vinyl actually in one of my storage bins because I got about, I don't know, 70 or so albums of Miles Davis back there. And I thought I had put all my Miles Davis albums um, all together. So I'm kind of shocked that there is any of them out in the back there. Um, this was an interesting, um, let's say unusual album. This is kind of in the period between um, his classic first quintet, which had John Old Coltrane on saxophones, Red Garland on piano. Red Garland, I always say, is very underrated. Uh, Paul Chambers on bass and Philly Joe Jones on drums. And it has that entire group on here, but it's got Cannonball Adderley um, added on saxophone as well. So I, I, I think this was maybe toward the end of the quintet period here um, when Miles ended up swapping out a few of the musicians. And uh, this is would be just before the kind of blue period and kind of after all of the um, prestige records, uh, quartet stuff, which most of the original quartet stuff, the, the Red Garland, John Coltrane Quartet, was on Prestige. It's classic albums, you know, Working with the Miles Davis Quintet, Smoking with the Miles Davis Quartet, all, all of those. Uh, relaxing with the Miles Davis Quartet. So this would have been one that he probably created a short time after signing on to um, Columbia Records, where he spent most of his career, and most of his albums are in Columbia. Um, and what can you say, you know, in all, it's, it's um, a six piece instead of his normal quintet. Philly Joe Jones is just a great drummer that I loved. I remember when Philly was alive, I can remember hearing Philly Joe Jones in the early 1980s being interviewed on a jazz station that we have uh, that comes out of New Jersey. Pretty sure it was on that station. And he was doing um, a Tad Dameron thing where he was in a band where he was playing all of Tad Dameron's music at that time, which I think was pretty much the last thing that he did before he passed away. Uh, Paul Chambers passed away quite young. Red Garland, I think. Yeah, I want to say, I don't recall. Red Garland, when did he pass away? I want to say either the late, very late 70s or early 80s. He was one of those guys that maybe didn't get the recognition he deserved. Actually, he passed away in 1984. See, I just looked that up on the computer. Um, I never heard of his passing, so here was a guy that I didn't know for a couple decades um, had passed away. Uh, after playing with Miles, he did a bunch of solo albums, uh, a lot as, as a trio, I think, um, just a piano, bass and drums trio kind of thing. But they weren't real say commercially successful or quite as noted as I guess they could have been in the jazz world. And I don't want to necessarily say he slipped into obscurity, but um, I believe that he had moved back to um, initially where, where he came from. I want to say Texas. Um, I think, actually, let me look. Yeah, it was Texas. Um, and he had kind of gone back there, so he didn't kind of stay around in the jazz capitals of the world. And I don't really think that he, he definitely very toured around very much um, after that initial Miles Davis period and right after that when he was still actively doing a lot of recording. Um, and But he continued to play with guys like Paul Chambers and Philly Joe Jones. Uh, but when he passed away in 1984, gee, I don't even think that the local jazz station even made mention of it, which was sad. And like I said, I didn't find out for... 15 or 20 years after that he had passed away. Um, but I always thought his playing was underrated. And um, you know, maybe it's because most of his work was chordal in nature and more in support of the group. But to me, he was one of the gems in this first Miles Davis quintet. And uh, what can I say? There's uh, you know, some standard things on here you would expect. Um, straight no chaser, two bass hit. Dr. Jekyll, which I, which um, isn't that a Jackie McLean tune? Um, 
But this is just another, you know, Miles at this point put out so many great acoustic jazz albums. And that this is one of them. I'm gonna I'm gonna select another and see if I don't get an ECM this time. Well, wouldn't you know, Jesus, I I, I did. Is this an ECM? Yes, this is an ECM. Now here's one that goes back to the early eighties. Um and this was not initially released here in the United States. There was a funny period when, um, back in the 70s, in the late 70s, mid 70s to late 70s, Warner Brothers Records was distributing ECM records in America. And it seems like every ECM album that came out, when Warner Brothers was doing the distribution in America, all of those albums came out in America. Once. Warner Brothers stopped distributing ECM records and ECM went with other companies and those companies switched over the years. But after that Warner Brothers period, it seemed like the American distributors, the ECM records were picking and choosing which ECM albums they were going to release in America. As a result, probably a good 20%, I'd say, or more of the ECM albums never got released over here in America. Some of that's changed in the years since uh, with things being reissued on CD. But I'm talking about the, the period. And I remember one of them was the Adelhard Reutinger, which is one of my all time favorite ECM albums. I picked up at the same store, I think at the same day that I picked this one up. Harold Anderson uh, Mold Concert. John Taylor, Bill Frizzell, Alphonse Mouzaun. Um, a great band, uh, a little rough recording because I think this was an outdoor festival, I want to say. It was at a jazz festival, which Lee in Norway recorded in August 1981, which leads me to think that it was an outdoor festival. Certainly the sound suggests it. And there's one thing that you don't want in a live album, and that's the outdoor recording because you just can't capture especially when there's acoustic instruments involved. Uh, and, you know, with the exception of the electric guitar of Bill Frizzell, this is all acoustic. You got drums, upright bass, and piano, acoustic piano by John Taylor. It's kind of, this is kind of a weird band, too. Um, and, and not, I certainly wouldn't rank this as being amongst Harold Anderson's better recordings either. Um, just because it's a really kind of weird combination. There's nothing wrong with the way anybody plays, but musically it's a weird combination because Bill Frizzell is in his most fusion mode, oriented mode. Uh, this would be r roughly the same time that he was playing in Jan Garbrick's group. And toward the end of him being in Jan Garbrick's group, I saw him live, um, which would have been you know, like around 82 or 83. Um, Live, he, he had a much more aggressive, uh, distorted kind of fusion tone that he didn't really continue to use after that point very much. But it's on a couple of recordings, and this is one of them. And it's kind of weird to have that fusion-y, distorted guitar sound with uh, upright bass and acoustic piano. It doesn't always work. It kind of sounds like there should have been a more a cleaner tone used with it. John Taylor plays fine as no. John Taylor couldn't play poorly if he tried, as far as I'm concerned. Harold Anderson plays fine. Alphonse Mazan I've never been a big fan of. I have a couple of his solo records, but he's a fusion drummer. Very good technically drummer, no doubt about it, but a very a, a kind of loud, aggressive fusion drummer. And uh, it, it's evident here. I mean, you would never mistake this for being even Jack DeJunette, you know, who can play fusion. Um, Jack DeJunette or uh, John Christensen or um, Mike DePasqua or somebody like that on drums. This is kind of loud, bombastic drumming a bit, a bit more than I think the music calls for. Except for, so it's almost like you got two bands. You got like Bill Frizzell and Alphonse playing together in a fusion thing, and John Taylor and Harold Anderson playing together in more of an, an acoustic European jazz vibe thing. Um, but strangely enough, Bill Frizzell wasn't, 
you know, at that point, he didn't have any solo albums out quite yet. I think his first one came out in 82. So he, he didn't have the name that he's since gotten um, or reputation. So I guess they didn't think that Errol Anderson had enough of a name in America, whoever the hell was distributing an ECM records at the time. I remember I had to go to New York City and get this at an import specialty shop. I don't know if it's still there. Probably not. Um, where I spent a fortune one day there and got a whole bunch of import things that, you know, were were imports, were things you couldn't get in America. Um, and even the even though I did have local stores that had import sections um, here in New Jersey, they tended not to carry really the ECM import stuff. Uh, the, their import stuff was more along the rock lines. So in order to get these records at the time, you had to either go to a big city uh, and a real specialty store like in New York City, or I guess maybe L.A., uh, or do the mail order route, you know, try to find um, a place that specialized in jazz, which I did. I, I found one or two of them back in the old days. I'm talking long before the Internet, um, where, you know, I found a, a couple jazz catalogs that would have rare things and import things. And there's the band. It's not It's not a bad recording. Um, it might be w one of the better ones, actually. It's. I don't consider it a very good album in Harold Anderson's catalog because he's really done a lot of exceptional albums. But many of his albums are extremely low key. That might be one that's better suited to, to driving in the car around with because, you know, a lot of the quieter things get lost in the the engine noise and the, the road noise, and I'm talking even if you got the windows rolled all the way up when you're driving around in your car. So maybe when I'm driving, there's times when I listen to music that's the slightly more aggressive albums by an artist, or, you know, or ones that have uh, a heavy percussion section to them or drive to them. And this is one of them. I might put this on in the car. I generally don't listen to it much at home. Um... So once again, I don't really know if this video is going to come out, and I tried also recording simultaneously on my iPad, which is the way I want to go. Um, but I have to get some kind of stand because the only problem with the iPad is if I put it on the desktop, you get a, uh, a nice view of my stomach, which you certainly don't need, and I can't put it any higher than that. So I have to get some kind of stand that I can put the iPad on to try to film on, in case these videos in this old computer uh, decide not to come out. <clears throat> so, you know, I was going to do another vinyl selection if, if I was sure that um, it were going to come out, the video were going to come out. But, you know, I don't want to tempt fate, so maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll cut this one now and, um, you know, come back sooner and, you know, maybe try to do another shorter one um, if this one comes out. And I'll just do another, you know, video that's less than a half hour, um, you know, sooner than than I would normally have done it. So, anyway, thanks for the uh, nice words that people have um, sent to me regarding my uh, my videos. And I will be back soon to do uh, another Tales from the Garage. I hope everybody's doing well, and I appreciate you guys' support. Take care. Tune in next time for more Tales from the Garage.